Section 19 of Tom Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mary Rohde. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Book Six, containing about three weeks. Chapter One of Love. In our last book we had been obliged to deal pretty much with the passion of love, and in our succeeding book shall be forced to handle this subject still more largely. It may not, therefore, in this place be improper to apply ourselves to the examination of that modern doctrine by which certain philosophers, among many other wonderful discoveries, pretend to have found out that there is no such passion in the human breast. Whether these philosophers be the same with that surprising sect, who are honorably mentioned by the late Dr. Swift as having, by the mere force of genius alone, without the least assistance of any kind of learning, or even reading, discovered that profound and invaluable secret that there is no God or whether they are not rather the same with those who some years since very much alarmed the world by showing that there were no such things as virtue or goodness really existing in human nature and who deduced our best actions from pride i will not here presume to determine in reality I am inclined to suspect that all these several finders of truth are the very identical men who are by others called the finders of gold. The method used in both these searches after truth and after gold, being indeed one and the same, namely the searching, rummaging, and examining into a nasty place, indeed in the former instances, into the nastiest of all places, a bad mind. But though in this particular, and perhaps in their success, the truth-finder and the gold-finder may very properly be compared together, yet in modesty, surely, there can be no comparison between the two. For who ever heard of a gold-finder that had the impudence or folly to assert, from the ill success of his search that there was no such thing as gold in the world whereas the truth finder having raked out that jakes his own mind and being there capable of tracing no ray of divinity nor anything virtuous or good or lovely or loving very fairly honestly and logically concludes that no such things exist in the whole creation to avoid, however, all contention, if possible, with these philosophers, if they will be called so, and to show our own disposition to accommodate matters peaceably between us, we shall here make them some concessions which may possibly put an end to the dispute. First, we will grant that many minds, and perhaps those of the philosophers, are entirely free from the least traces of such a passion secondly that what is commonly called love namely the desire of satisfying a voracious appetite with a certain quantity of delicate white human flesh is by no means that passion for which i here contend this is indeed more properly hunger and as no glutton is ashamed to apply the word love to his appetite and to say he loves such and such dishes so may the lover of this kind with equal propriety say he hungers after such and such women thirdly i will grant which i believe will be a most acceptable concession that this love for which i am an advocate though it satisfies itself in a much more delicate manner doth nevertheless seek its own satisfaction as much as the grossest of all our appetites and lastly that this love when it operates towards one of a different sex is very apt towards its complete gratification to call in the aid of that hunger which i have mentioned above and which it is so far from abating 
that it heightens all its delights to a degree scarce imaginable by those who have never been susceptible of any other emotions than what have proceeded from appetite alone in return to all these concessions i desire of the philosophers to grant that there is in some i believe in many human breasts a kind and benevolent disposition which is gratified by contributing to the happiness of others that in this gratification alone as in friendship in parental and filial affection as indeed in general philanthropy there is a great and exquisite delight that if we will not call such disposition love we have no name for it that though the pleasures arising from such pure love may be heightened and sweetened by the assistance of amorous desires yet the former can subsist alone nor are they destroyed by the intervention of the latter lastly that esteem and gratitude are the proper motives to love as youth and beauty are to desire and therefore though such desire may naturally cease when age or sickness overtakes its object yet these can have no effect on love nor even shake or remove from a good mind that sensation or passion which hath gratitude and esteem for its basis to deny the existence of a passion of which we often see manifest instances seems to be very strange and absurd and can indeed proceed only from that self-admonition which we have mentioned above but how unfair is this doth the man who recognizes in his own heart no traces of avarice or ambition conclude therefore that there are no such passions in human nature why will we not modestly observe the same rule in judging of the good as well as the evil in others or why in any case will we as shakespeare phrases it put the world in our own person predominant vanity is i am afraid too much concerned here this is one instance of that adulation which we bestow on our own minds and this almost universally for there is scarce any man how much soever he may despise the character of a flatterer but will condescend in the meanest manner to flatter himself to those therefore i apply for the truth of the above observations whose own minds can bear testimony to what i have advanced examine your heart my good reader and resolve whether you do believe these matters with me if you do you may now proceed to their exemplification in the following pages if you do not you have i assure you already read more than you have understood and it would be wiser to pursue your business or your pleasures such as they are than to throw away any more of your time in reading what you can neither taste nor comprehend to treat of the effects of love to you must be as absurd as to discourse on colors to a man born blind since possibly your idea of love may be as absurd as that which we are told such blind man once entertained of the color scarlet that color seemed to him to be very much like the sound of a trumpet and love probably may in your opinion very greatly resemble a dish of soup or a sirloin of roast beef chapter two the character of mrs western her great learning and knowledge of the world and an instance of the deep penetration which she derived from those advantages the reader hath seen mr western his sister and daughter with young jones and the parson going together to mr western's house where the greater part of the company spent the evening with much joy and festivity sophia was indeed the only grave person for as to jones though love had now gotten entire possession of his heart yet the pleasing reflection of mr allworthy's recovery and the presence of his mistress joined to some tender looks which she now and then could not refrain from giving him so elevated our hero 
that he joined the mirth of the other three, who were perhaps as good-humoured people as any in the world. Sophia retained the same gravity of countenance the next morning at breakfast, when she retired likewise earlier than usual, leaving her father and aunt together. The squire took no notice of this change in his daughter's disposition. To say the truth, though he was somewhat of a politician, and had been twice a candidate in the country interest at an election, he was a man of no great observation. His sister was a lady of a different turn. She had lived about the court, and had seen the world. Hence she had required all that knowledge which the said world usually communicates, and was a perfect mistress of manners, customs, ceremonies, and fashions. Nor did her erudition stop here. She had considerably improved her mind by study. She had not only read all the modern plays, operas, oratorios, poems, and romances, in all which she was a critic, but had gone through Rapin's History of England, Echard's Roman History, and many French memoirs pour servir à l'histoire. To these she had added most of the political pamphlets and journals published within the last twenty years from which she had attained a very competent skill in politics, and could discourse very learnedly on the affairs of Europe. She was, moreover, excellently well skilled in the doctrine of amour, and knew better than anybody who and who were together, a knowledge which she the more easily attained, as her pursuit of it was never diverted by any affairs of her own for either she had no inclinations, or they had never been solicited, which last is indeed very probable. For her masculine person, which was near six foot high, added to her manner and learning, possibly prevented the other sex from regarding her, notwithstanding her petticoats, in the light of a woman. However, as she had considered the matter scientifically, she perfectly well knew, though she had never practised them, all the arts which fine ladies use when they desire to give encouragement, or to conceal liking, with all the long appendage of smiles, ogles, glances, etc., as they are at present practised in the beau monde. To sum the whole, no species of disguise or affectation had escaped her notice, but as to the plain simple workings of honest nature, as she had never seen any such, she could know but little of them. By means of this wonderful sagacity, Mrs. Western had now, as she thought, made a discovery of something in the mind of Sophia. The first hint of this she took from the behavior of the young lady in the field of battle, and the suspicion which she then conceived was greatly corroborated by some observations which she had made that evening and the next morning. However, being greatly cautious to avoid being found in a mistake, she carried the secret a whole fortnight in her bosom, giving only some oblique hints by simpering, winks, nods, and now and then dropping an obscure word, which indeed sufficiently alarmed Sophia, but did not at all affect her brother. Being at length, however, thoroughly satisfied of the truth of her observation, she took an opportunity one morning, when she was alone with her brother, to interrupt one of his whistles in the following manner. "'Pray, brother, have you not observed something very extraordinary in my niece lately?' "'No, not I,' answered Weston. "'Is anything the matter with the girl?' "'I think there is,' replied she and something of much consequence, too. "'Why, she doth not complain of anything,' cries Western, "'and she hath had the smallpox. "'Brother,' returned she, "'girls are liable to other distempers besides the smallpox, "'and sometimes possibly to much worse.' Here Western interrupted her with much earnestness, and begged her, if anything ailed his daughter, to acquaint him immediately, adding she knew he loved her more than his own soul, and that he would send to the world's end for the best physician to her. "'Nay, nay,' answered she, smiling, "'the distemper is not so terrible. 
I believe, brother, you are convinced I know the world, and I promise you I was never more deceived in my life if my niece be not most desperately in love. How? In love? cries Western in a passion. In love? Without acquainting me? I'll disinherit her. I'll turn her out of doors, stark naked, without a farthing. Is all my kindness for your unvodness o' your come to this? To fall in love without asking me leave? But you will not, answered Mrs. Western, turn this daughter, whom you love better than your own soul, out of doors, before you know whether you shall approve her choice. Suppose she should have fixed on the very person whom you yourself would wish. I hope you would not be angry then. No, no, cries Western, that would make a difference. If she marries the man I would have her, she may love whom she pleases. I shan't trouble my head about that. That is spoken, answered the sister, like a sensible man. But I believe the very person she hath chosen would be the very person you would choose for her. I will disclaim all knowledge of the world if it is not so. And I believe, brother, you will allow I have some. Why, look ye, sister, said Western, I do believe you have as much as any woman, and to be sure those are women's matters. You know I don't love to hear you talk about politics. They belong to us, and petticoats should not meddle. But come, who is the man? Mary, said she, you may find him out yourself, if you please. You, who are so great a politician, can be at no great loss. The judgment which can penetrate into the cabinets of princes, and discover the secret springs which move the great state wheels in all the political machines of Europe, must surely with very little difficulty find out what passes in the rude, uninformed mind of a girl. Sister, cries the squire, I have often warned you not to talk the court gibberish to me. I tell you, I don't understand the lingo, but I can read a journal or the London Evening Post. Perhaps, indeed, there may be now and then a verse which I can't make much of, because half the letters are left out. Yet I know very well what is meant by that, and that our affairs don't go so well as they should do, because of bribery and corruption. I pity your country ignorance from my heart, cries the lady. Do you? answered Western. And I pity your town learning. I had rather be anything than a courtier and a Presbyterian and a Hanoverian, too, as some people, I believe, are. If you mean, answered she, you know I am a woman, brother, and it signifies nothing what I am. Besides, I do know you are a woman, cries the squire, and it's well for thee that art one. If hadst been a man, I promise thee I had lent thee a flick long ago. Ay, there, said she, in that flick lies all your fancied superiority. Your bodies, not your brains, are stronger than ours. Believe me, it is well for you that you are able to beat us, or such is the superiority of our understanding we should make all of you what the brave and wise and witty and polite are already, our slaves. I am glad I know your mind, answered the squire, but we'll talk more of this matter another time. At present, do tell me, what man is it you mean about my daughter? Hold a moment, said she, while I digest that sovereign contempt I have for your sex or else I ought to be angry, too, with you. There, I have made a shift to gulp it down. And now, good politics, sir, what think you of Mr. Blyfell? Did she not faint away on seeing him lie breathless on the ground? Did she not, after he was recovered, turn pale again the moment we came up to that part of the field where he stood? And pray, what else should be the occasion of all her melancholy that night at supper, the next morning, and indeed ever since? Poor George, cries the squire, now you mind me, aunt, I remember it all. It is certainly so, and I am glad, aunt, with all my heart. 
I knew Sophie was a good girl and would not fall in love to make me angry. I was never more rejoiced in my life, for nothing can lie so handy together as our two estates. I had this matter in my head some time ago, for certainly the two estates are in a manner joined together in matrimony already, and it would be a thousand pities to part them. It is true, indeed, there be larger estates in the kingdom, but not in this county, and I had rather bait something than marry my daughter among strangers and foreigners. Besides, most of such great estates be in the hands of lords, and I hate the very name of them. Un. Well, but, sister, what would you advise me to do? For I tell you, women know these matters better than we do. Oh, your humble servant, sir, answered the lady. We are obliged to you for allowing us a capacity in anything. Since you are pleased, then, most politic, sir, to ask my advice, I think you may propose the match to Allworthy yourself. There is no indecorum in the proposals coming from the parent of either side. King Alcinous, in Mr. Pope's Odyssey, offers his daughter to Ulysses. I need not caution so politic a person not to say that your daughter is in love. That would indeed be against all rules. Well, said the squire, I will propose it, but I shall certainly lend on a flick if he should refuse me. Fear not, cries Mrs. Western, the match is too advantageous to be refused. I don't know that, answered the squire. Allworthy is a queer boon, and money hath no effect on. Brother, said the lady, your politics astonish me. Are you really to be imposed on by professions? Do you think Mr. Allworthy hath more contempt for money than other men, because he professes more? Such credulity would better become one of us weak women than that wise sex which heaven hath formed for politicians? Indeed, brother, you would make a fine plenipo to negotiate with the French. They would soon persuade you that they take towns out of mere defensive principles. Sister, answered the squire with much scorn, let your friends at court answer for the towns taken. As you are a woman, I shall lay no blame upon you, for I suppose they are wiser than to trust women with secrets. He accompanied this with so sarcastical a laugh that Mrs. Western could bear no longer. She had been all this time fretted in a tender part, for she was indeed very deeply skilled in these matters, and very violent in them, and therefore burst forth in a rage, declared her brother to be both a clown and a blockhead, and that she would stay no longer in his house. The squire, though perhaps he had never read Machiavel, was, however, in many points, a perfect politician. He strongly held all those wise tenets which are so well inculcated in that politico-peripatetic school of Exchange Alley. He knew the just value and only use of money, namely, to lay it up. He was likewise well skilled in the exact value of reversions, expectations, etc., and had often considered the amount of his sister's fortune, and the chance which here his posterity had on inheriting it. This he was infinitely too wise to sacrifice to a trifling resentment. When he found, therefore, he had carried matters too far, he began to think of reconciling them, which was no very difficult task, as the lady had great affection for her brother, and still greater for her niece. And though too susceptible of an affront offered to her skill in politics, on which she much valued herself, was a woman of a very extraordinary good and sweet disposition. Having first, therefore, laid violent hands on the horses, for whose escape from the stable no place but the window was left open, he next applied himself to his sister, softened and soothed her by unsaying all he had said, and by assertions directly contrary to those which had incensed her. 
Lastly, he summoned the eloquence of Sophia to his assistance, who, besides a most graceful and winning address, had the advantage of being heard with great favour and partiality by her aunt. The result of the whole was a kind smile from Mrs. Western, who said, "'Brother, you are absolutely a perfect Croat, but as those have their use in the army of the Empress Queen, so you likewise have some good in you. I will therefore once more sign a treaty of peace with you, and see that you do not infringe it on your side. At least, as you are so excellent a politician, I may expect you will keep your leagues, like the French, till your interest calls upon you to break them. CHAPTER Three, CONTAINING TWO DEFIANCES TO THE CRITICS The squire, having settled matters with his sister, as we have seen in the last chapter, was so greatly impatient to communicate the proposal to Allworthy, that Mrs. Western had the utmost difficulty to prevent him from visiting that gentleman in his sickness for this purpose. Mr. Allworthy had been engaged to dine with Mr. Western at the time when he was taken ill. He was therefore no sooner discharged out of the custody of physic, but he thought, as was usual with him on all occasions, both the highest and the lowest, of fulfilling his engagement. In the interval between the time of the dialogue in the last chapter and this day of public entertainment, Sophia had, from certain obscure hints thrown out by her aunt, collected some apprehension that the sagacious lady suspected her passion for Jones. She now resolved to take this opportunity of wiping out all such suspicion, and for that purpose to put an entire constraint on her behaviour. First, she endeavoured to conceal a throbbing melancholy heart with the utmost sprightliness in her countenance, and the highest gaiety in her manner. Secondly, she addressed her whole discourse to Mr. Blyfill, and took not the least notice of poor Jones the whole day. The squire was so delighted with this conduct of his daughter, that he scarce ate any dinner, and spent almost his whole time in watching opportunities of conveying signs of his approbation by winks and nods to his sister, who was not at first altogether so pleased with what she saw as was her brother. In short, Sophia so greatly overacted her part, that her aunt was at first staggered, and began to suspect some affectation in her niece but as she was herself a woman of great art, so she soon attributed this to extreme art in Sophia. She remembered the many hints she had given her niece concerning her being in love, and imagined the young lady had taken this way to rally her out of her opinion by an overacted civility, a notion that was greatly corroborated by the excessive gaiety with which the whole was accompanied. We cannot here avoid remarking that this conjecture would have been better founded had Sophia lived ten years in the air of Grosvenor Square, where young ladies do learn a wonderful knack of rallying and playing with that passion which is a mighty serious thing in woods and grooves a hundred miles distant from London. To say the truth, in discovering the deceit of others, it matters much that our own art be wound up, if I may use the expression, in the same key with theirs. For very artful men sometimes miscarry, by fancying others wiser, or in other words greater knaves, than they really are. As this observation is pretty deep, I will illustrate it by the following short story. Three countrymen were pursuing a Wilshire thief through Brentford. The simplest of them, seeing the Wilshire house, written under a sign, advised his companions to enter it, for there most probably they would find their countrymen. The second, who was wiser, laughed at this simplicity. But the third, who was wiser still, answered, let us go in, however, for he may think we should not suspect him of going amongst his own countrymen. 
They accordingly went in and searched the house, and by that means missed overtaking the thief who was at that time but a little way before them, and who, as they all knew but had never once reflected, could not read. The reader will pardon a digression in which so invaluable a secret is communicated, since every gamester will agree how necessary it is to know exactly the play of another in order to countermine him. This will, moreover, afford a reason why the wiser man, as is often seen, is the bubble of the weaker, and why many simple and innocent characters are so generally misunderstood and misrepresented. But what is most material, this will account for the deceit which Sophia put on her politic aunt. Dinner being ended, and the company retired into the garden, Mr. Western, who was thoroughly convinced of the certainty of what his sister had told him, took Mr. Allworthy aside, and very bluntly proposed a match between Sophia and young Mr. Blifel. Mr. Allworthy was not one of those men whose hearts flutter at any unexpected and sudden tidings of worldly profit. His mind was, indeed, tempered with that philosophy which becomes a man and a Christian. He affected no absolute superiority to all pleasure and pain, to all joy and grief, but was not at the same time to be discomposed and ruffled by every accidental blast by every smile or frown of fortune. He received, therefore, Mr. Western's proposal without any visible emotion, or without any alteration of countenance. He said the alliance was such as he sincerely wished, then launched forth into a very just encomium of the young lady's merit, acknowledged the offer to be advantageous in point of fortune, and after thanking Mr. Western for the good opinion he had professed of his nephew, concluded that if the young people liked each other, he should be very desirous to complete the affair. Western was a little disappointed at Mr. Allworthy's answer, which was not so warm as he had expected. He treated the doubt whether the young people might like one another with great contempt saying that parents were the best judges of proper matches for their children, that for his part he should insist on the most resigned obedience from his daughter, and if any young fellow could refuse such a bedfellow, he was his humble servant, and hoped there was no harm done. Allworthy endeavoured to soften this resentment by many eulogiums on Sophia, declaring he had no doubt but that Mr. Blifel would very gladly receive the offer. But all was ineffectual. He could obtain no other answer from the squire but, I say no more, I humbly hope there's no harm done, that's all, which words he repeated at least a hundred times before they parted. Allworthy was too well acquainted with his neighbour to be offended at this behaviour and though he was so averse to the rigour which some parents exercise on their children in the article of marriage that he had resolved never to force his nephew's inclinations he was nevertheless much pleased with the prospect of this union for the whole country resounded the praises of sophia and he had himself greatly admired the uncommon endowments of both her mind and person to which I believe we may add the consideration of her vast fortune, which, though he was too sober to be intoxicated with it, he was too sensible to despise. And here, in defiance of all the barking critics in the world, I must and will introduce a digression concerning true wisdom, of which Mr. Allworthy was in reality as great a pattern as he was of goodness. True wisdom, then, notwithstanding all which Mr. Hogarth's poor poet may have writ against riches, and in spite of all which any rich well-fed divine may have preached against pleasure, consists not in the contempt of either of these. A man may have as much wisdom in the possession of an affluent fortune as any beggar in the streets, 
or may enjoy a handsome wife or a hearty friend, and still remain as wise as any sour popish recluse, who buries all his social faculties, and starves his belly while he well lashes his back. To say truth, the wisest man is the likeliest to possess all worldly blessings in an eminent degree, for, as that moderation which wisdom prescribes is the surest way to useful wealth, so can it alone qualify us to taste many pleasures. The wise man gratifies every appetite and every passion, while the fool sacrifices all the rest to pall and satiate one. It may be objected that very wise men have been notoriously avaricious. I answer, not wise in that instance. It may likewise be said that the wisest men have been in their youth immoderately fond of pleasure. I answer, they were not wise then. Wisdom, in short, whose lessons have been represented as so hard to learn by those who never were at her school, only teaches us to extend a simple maxim universally known and followed, even in the lowest life, a little farther than that life carries it. And this is not to buy at too dear a price. Now, whoever takes this maxim abroad with him into the grand market of the world, and constantly applies it to honors, to riches, to pleasures, and to every other commodity which that market affords, is, I will venture to affirm, a wise man, and must be so acknowledged in the worldly sense of the word. For he makes the best of bargains, since in reality he purchases everything at the price only of a little trouble, and carries home all the good things I have mentioned, while he keeps his health, his innocence, and his reputation, the common prices which are paid for them by others, entire and to himself. From this moderation, likewise, he learns two other lessons which complete his character. First, never to be intoxicated when he hath made the best bargain, nor dejected when the market is empty, or when its commodities are too dear for his purchase. But I must remember on what subject I am writing, and not trespass too far on the patience of a good-natured critic. Here, therefore, I put an end to the chapter. End of section 19